Hello friends, for today's video I wanted to do basically a recent reads, uh, a wrap-up style video going through five different books that I have picked up over the last couple of months. I have picked up a lot of books recently and I just feel like I haven't had the chance to sit down and talk about them and so I thought I would do a couple of dedicated wrap-up style videos. So we'll have this one today and then we'll have another one probably in a couple weeks or so and then we'll go over my thoughts on a lot of the things I got around to in the whole first quarter of the year. The five books we're going to be talking about today, which I'll have timestamps in the description bar down below in case you'd like to bounce back and forth between them, but we have The Long Walk to Freedom, which was Nelson Mandela's autobiography. Then we have Guards, Guards, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, A Study in Drowning, and The Girl in the Tower. I'm going to start with Nelson Mandela's autobiography, which I feel is probably a mistake because just thinking about certain parts of that book make me really emotional and I'm kind of nervous. I'm going to I'm going to need to be like, "Hold on a sec." and then keep going. I think it's kind of dumb to start with it. But I did not know basically anything about Nelson Mandela. I'd heard his name. I knew of him vaguely, but if you had asked me beforehand to tell you anything about him or his life or the impact that he had on South Africa, I wouldn't have not, actually I should clarify, not just South Africa, but a lot of the world. He was this international figure. I'm sure most of you know who he is. Um, but regardless, I would not have been able to tell you much at all. I've never seen any of the movies, of which there are a lot. Uh, I've never seen any of the movies about him and I have not read all that much that involves uh, South Africa or his role in being able to push back against oppression. So, I was really felt, I felt like I was learning so much in reading this autobiography, not just about him and his life, but about South Africa. And if you do go into this book, I think that a lot of times when we think of autobiographies and memoirs, we're really zeroing in on a specific event in a person's life or a specific dynamic between a relationship between, you know, the person and their family members or spouse or something like that and how it shaped them, how it's affected them, that trauma you, you really focused in. And with A Long Walk to Freedom, it is going over and encompasses so much of his life and so much of South Africa's, the political nature of that time, the oppression, the racism. So you're really going through so much. And I've read Trevor Noah's memoir uh, and that sort of glimpses, I think it's even titled, its full title is um, A South African Childhood, something like that. But the book is Born a Crime and you're looking at pieces of his life growing up. And this was after a lot of what the work that Nelson Mandela had done had actually had an impact on that country. So Anyway, I, there was so much to take in. I learned so much reading this book, but there were just a, a few key things about it. it. It's hard to talk about briefly because I would just highly recommend that you read it for yourself, but just the amount that he had to sacrifice in his own life in order to fight for his people. And one of the sort of big takeaways if I'm being uh, really general here, because there's a lot about that book that is worth discussing, but how much he did not get to really have the richest of personal lives because he was fighting to hopefully enrich the lives of others. And there's, oh my gosh, this is why I was like, I should probably talk about this at the end, <laughs> but let's just do it now. Um, there's a part toward the end where he talks about this sacrifice of his, because he's kind of looking back on his life uh, at the end and this long walk to freedom and how there's still more to go. But he talks about how when you look at your child and they ask you, basically, where are you? Why are you never home? And he says something along the lines of, because there's so many, ah, see, this, ah, see, this is why I need a minute, <laughs> because it's just like, uh, it got me and I almost started crying when I was reading it and now I'm basically crying now. Uh, hold on a sec. Basically that you look at your child and you tell them because there's so many other children. Uh, gosh, I thought I got, I thought I composed myself like you. That's the completion of the sentence. Um, and how you pretty much just, then the sentence just dies. You don't really finish the thought because how do you tell your family, your spouse, your children, your mother, how do you tell them these people that you feel not an obligation in sort of this uh, negative way, but these people that you feel 
you love so much and be, when you love people, you give so much of yourself to them and you do so much for them. But how do you explain to those people, even though I've made these commitments to you, you are my people, you're my family. How do I then basically turn my back on you for everyone else? And how he felt he had to do that because in a perfect society, that would not be asked of a person. You wouldn't have to make those sacrifices. But because they weren't there yet, uh, he felt that he had this obligation, not just to his family, but to the people of his country. And it was a balancing act. And pretty much he, f he almost is describing the fact that he feels like he failed, that he didn't get to be the father he wanted to be. He didn't get to be the husband he wanted to be, the son he wanted to be, the friend he wanted to be. And he was still somebody who put in effort where he could, but if you don't know, he was imprisoned for decades for the fight against oppression. And so he also, he hardly got to see his family, talk to his family. And in typical, fa his typical fashion, he also, while he was imprisoned, uh, he definitely fought for the rights of prisoners from prison. He was a lawyer, if you didn't know. So he, I was in talking about this book to my husband saying, I feel like he was always the smartest person in the room. And I wonder what it's like to be, <laughs> to exist like that, because he has this sort of calm but cheeky demeanor to him. Um, but then also just seeing how he grows and how he reflects on his views earlier in his life, how he would navigate certain situations differently. And then also while he's in prison, at one point there are people who are also fighting, you know, they're part of the resistance basically, and they're in prison with him and they're pretty much calling him soft and that he's too neutral es essentially. And he's like, what? <laughs> he was sort of flabbergasted at that, but then he's always willing to listen. And even if he considers somebody almost like an adversary, the way in which he's willing to put differences aside to work alongside people for the the best outcome possible. It's just incredibly admirable. Uh, so anyway, it was a fantastic book. If you are curious to read it, I know a lot of times there's samples online that you can find of the opening chapters or things like that. If you can go to your library and read the last couple pages, uh, I feel like that's what will make you want to read the book, which I know sounds odd because we're so accustomed in book culture, you could say, of not looking at the end, but it's an autobiography. I don't feel like it's like, oh my gosh, but it's going to spoil uh, what happened um, because it's history <laughs> and it's pretty recent history too. It's a, it's great. It was phenomenal. Highly recommend and uh, just buckle in because it's, uh, it's a lot. But anyway, now let's get to Guards Guards. I actually think Guards Guards was a good one to read around the same time because uh, Guards Guards is my first entry into Discworld and I knew Discworld was going to be satirical and poke at society and the ways in which people think, the way collectively we think or sometimes don't and how we can be misled and everything. So I do feel like as far as the commentary in this that it was nice to have as a juxtaposition. You have one that's real life, a juxtaposition to A Long Walk to Freedom. You have real life, a real person. They're uh, existence and how it impacted the world. And then you have something that's more, ob it's obviously fiction, but it's sillier and it's, you could argue, more digestible in a sense. So I enjoyed aspects of this so much. The first half of the book, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go to my local bookstores or the library and just check out a bunch more Discworld and get even more in in into it. I was really pumped. The second half of this book was a little bit of a letdown for me based off of how hyped I was throughout the first half. Because the first half I was reading, I was taking pictures, I was sending screenshots, or well, they're not screenshots because it's not a digital copy, but I took a picture and then sent it to my husband being like, read this passage, it's so great. And I'm actually going to read a passage that for me was one of, I, I think this is what I wanted pretty much throughout the entirety of the book. So if you don't know the setup for Guards Guards, you have this rather apathetic person who is part of the the guard and they uh, vimes captain vimes and it's him and a few other people and they just they don't really enforce anything they just sort of exist <laughs> and one day this person who is a human and a very large human at that who was raised by dwarves and then is told the very sad news that he is not in fact a dwarf but he was adopted and it's time now to go live among the humans and he's like what if i'm just a really big dwarf and they're like you're not you're like six seven <laughs> 
he is going to go join the guard and they're like, what? This guy actually wants to enforce the law? Hilarity ensues and that's all very entertaining. I was tickled by so much of it. I was finding the humor to be to my liking, definitely, for a lot of it. And I liked a lot of the more poignant moments or the commentary on things I thought was fantastic. But regardless, the antagonist in this story is somebody who is trying to manipulate people so that they can gain more power, we'll say. And it's uh, up to our unlikely band of heroes to save the day. That's sort of the general setup here. But at one point, you're you're with the antagonist and they're thinking about how easy it is to manipulate people. And this quote I absolutely loved, it says, it was amazing this mystic business. You tell them a lie and then when you don't need it anymore, you tell them another lie and tell them they're progressing along the road to wisdom. Then instead of laughing, they follow you even more, hoping that at the heart of all the lies, they'll find the truth and bit by bit, they accept the unacceptable. Amazing. And I was like, okay, that was great. I loved that. I loved the way in which, even though this is not obviously a brand new book, this is still applicable, if not even more applicable to now than it was maybe when it was written. It's one of those things where it transcends the time it's written in and you can apply it to a lot of different things. In some ways, the humor in this and the way that it was analyzing how we are as people reminded me a little bit of Parks and Rec. Uh, so if you're a fan of that show, there's elements to this that I thought were a reminiscent of that. Or maybe I should say Parks and Rec is reminiscent of this. But regardless, the reason that the second half kind of started to let me down is because I thought the more clever parts of the story were kind of um, traded a little bit for the really dumb humor. And I like dumb humor. I like a mix of clever and dumb. I love it when you have them side by side. And I especially love when you can find that perfect balance of things being really emotional and really devastating and really gutting and also incredibly stupid and funny at the same time. For example, if you have not checked out Spy Family, check out Spy Family. It's a manga series and it's an anime. It's great. But the most recent two volumes, volume 10 and volume 11 especially, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> what is happening? Why am I so emotional all of a sudden? I almost started crying. I'm not that emotional of a person. I feel like if this is a person's first introduction to to me, um, they'd be like, does a girl cry a lot or something? But um, no, but I almost started crying multiple times in those, uh, those volumes of Spy Family. Point is, Spy Family is so ridiculous. It strikes that balance really well that I'm referring to. And so I was really happy because I felt like this was going to capture that. Maybe it wouldn't have the devastating moment so much, but the satire, I was, I feel like you could replace it uh, with satire. But the second half, I don't mean this to be mean to anybody who likes Marvel movies. I like some of the Marvel movies, but I do feel like occasionally the Marvel movies, they won't let a joke die or the jokes are placed in, in moments that I don't really feel like they work well in, it starts to feel very childish. And so I'm gonna describe it as Marvel humor just from those specific types of moments because some of it is funny. Anyway, so the kind of like Marvel humor in this toward the end, it was too much for me. And I was like, where's the really clever stuff? I missed that. So as an example, there's a character you know how people will say, like, your history or something like that when they're going to take someone out. They're like, your history. And um, there's a character that doesn't understand that phrase. So they'll just say a different subject. They'll be like, your geography. And it was funny at first. And then it at one point it was like, your homeroom economics or something like that. And I'm like, okay, can we move on from that joke? It was funny before, and now it's being used too much, and it's not as funny. And then there's also randomly, I mean, this was kind of funny. There's like randomly a Casablanca quote in this book where I'm like, what? <laughs> Why is this here? But that, I mean, that is kind of funny, but that's what I mean by it just starts to go just really um, not as clever. And uh, so that was a little bit of a bummer for me. It's, there's also a part where they're debating they're, they're going to have to try to shoot this dragon that they're afraid is going to destroy everything, basically. And some of the characters, you know, they're like, wait, weren't you really good at archery? Well, there's a one in a million chance that you can hit its vulnerable spot instead of saying vulnerable spot. 
And for about 30 pages, every time you came back to these characters, they were still like, wait, but what if it's one in a hundred thousand instead of one in a million? Isn't that worse? Because one in a million in the stories is pretty much guaranteed that you're going to make it happen. They're it just like... They were, they kept talking about it and they kept saying vulnerable wrong. And it was, I swear, it was about 30 pages where every time they'd come back to those characters, they were still going through that. And I'm like, maybe have them go through it two or three times. But every time we come back to them, can we move on, please? And so in the spirit of all that, I'm going to move on now. I liked aspects of this so much. And then other things were pretty big misses. I think if the dumb humor and the clever humor were mixed a little bit more instead of it feeling like a lot of the clever humor and some stupid humor was more at the beginning and then it was mostly dumb humor at the end. I think that if it had been balanced out, I would have liked it so much more. I would have liked it throughout. If it had stayed how it was in the first half, I also think perhaps this could have maybe been a novella and maybe I would have liked it even more. Um, but anyway, so mixed feelings. But uh, some of my friends that I've talked to about Discworld, um, like my friend Jesse, who has her own channel, Jesse May, my friend uh, Charles, who has his own channel as well. I was talking to him about it. And they've both seemed to have had some really good experiences with Discworld. And then some where they're like, uh, you know, I didn't like this one as much, or I didn't really like this one at all, or DNF this one or something like that. So um, I understand that there's so many works in Discworld that that one book is not necessarily an indication of everything you're going to get. So let me know your thoughts on Discworld, because I would love to hear what you have to say. Where's Guards Guards sit for you? Anyway, moving on now to The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I mentioned this one a little bit in a video I did recently about some adult fantasy standalones, as well as I did a whole discussion with some of my friends about this that I had buddy read it with. So I have had a chance to mention it here and there. This is a book where I actually have slightly conflicted feelings about as well, because I really... It's not going to be verbatim what I said about Guards Guards, but I really, really loved the beginning of this. And then I almost felt like there wasn't maybe anywhere we could have gone that would have been as strong as the beginning. Um, just based off of the premise, which if you don't know, the idea is that there is this young woman who makes a deal with this being and it essentially grants her immortality. However, she also will will be destined to be forgotten. So she is cursed and whenever she interacts with somebody, the second that person leaves the room or something of that sort, when they come back, they will see her and they won't remember anything about her. They won't remember any interaction. She also can't tell them about her curse. She can't write anything out. She pretty much can't leave a mark on the world. And you navigate that with her and it's actually incredibly devastating and heartbreaking. And how the curse works was actually really fascinating to dissect. Uh, the relationship with this being who's trying to break her because if she finally gives in, he gets to have her soul. And so you get to see how she resists and fights back and the ways in which she finds the strength to keep going, what she clings to in her own personal ways of trying to leave her mark when she can't really. I, I thought all of that was done really well. You do go back and forth between the past and the present, and the present was less engaging for me. It was kind of cool to see how she started out with where she's ended up. So I did enjoy that component of this split timeline, but I just found so much about the history part of it more fascinating. You do get introduced to another character partway through the story, and I also felt like the way that character's life was dissected was fantastic, and arguably maybe I related more to what that character was experiencing and going through. I don't want to say too much, though, because I feel like uh, that was something I was not expecting in the story, and so I want to make sure that if you've not picked this book up that you get to have that experience with it, too. Uh, but just the way everything plays out toward the end, I think... Um, like I said, I just don't know that we were ever going to have an ending that was quite going to satisfy me uh, as much as just the intrigue of it all and the mystery of it all and this the general experience that this character is having and how she deals with it. It was, it, it, but it had some moments though that made me so, uh, I, I was really taken aback because she is destined to be forgotten. You can imagine what that's like when it comes to her relationship with her family members, things like that, where the idea of that, when I put myself in that position and I imagined it, oh, it broke my heart. I felt so badly for this character. I also felt so strongly for her reasons why she made 
the deal that she made, this feeling of being incredibly trapped, of having no say in her own life, of wanting to have some semblance of freedom and agency, and the path in which uh, her life takes as a result of choosing herself, basically. Um, really, the, the good for me outweighed the negatives. I know that this book is somewhat controversial, not because of anything um, really serious or anything, but I just mean people seem to feel very strongly one way or the other. For me, I'm, I'm actually kind of in the middle. The strong points were so strong for me that I would put that among one of my favorite standalone adult fantasy works. However, I do definitely recognize why the criticisms exist that do, and I don't disagree with them necessarily. Not my absolute favorite V.E. Schwab book I've ever read, but man, those hard-hitting moments did really hit quite hard. Now, on to a study in drowning. So I will have, I don't know if it'll go up before or after this video, but I will have a whole dedicated reading vlog for this for Patreon. So if you're interested in seeing that, I'll have it linked. It'll just be a cozy little vlog. Um, but this was actually a patron pick. So over on Patreon, I asked everybody, what are some of your favorite books that you read last year or just some books that you really love? And then I wrote them all out. I cut them up and I put them in a little cup. And then each month I pick one. And unfortunately, the first book that I picked, I'm still waiting for it to come in from the library. Uh, but anyway, I was able to pick this one up as this was the second pick really enjoyed this one. It is a hint of, you know, dark academia, if you didn't know. Um, this The premise sounds kind of not like anything you've probably heard before, where this uh, young woman who is a university student and she is studying architecture and design is asked to, uh, well, she participates in this um, potential uh, opportunity where she can design, redesign this house of this author who has recently passed away. And this author is basically a national treasure and their works have a lot of uh, impact on how people see their country, their culture, another group of people, how they see class, things like that, folklore. And this author holds a lot of value, and their work, I should say, holds a lot of value to our main characters. So she doesn't really think being a first-year student and maybe not being the best at what she does that she is going to have her design chosen, but it is chosen, and then so she is going to this place, and she's pretty much living in this old, run-down manor, this guest house that's beside this house. It's not a haunted house story necessarily. Um, I wouldn't even describe this as a horror story. And there, I mean, as you're reading it, you're like, is this fantasy? And I don't want to say too much about that either. It was really quite an interesting blend. Uh, and I, I liked the blend. I thought based off the premise, because it is sort of this house by the sea and there's, you know, these folklore elements and there's questions about the house and the family and the way in which the author died. I thought it was going to be a little bit more like House of Salts and Sorrows, and I would say it is not. So if you maybe also drew that comparison, uh, they're not quite like that. This one is not quite so horror-leaning. But I actually was really surprised. It's primarily um, a discussion of trauma and the effects of how that can really play a role in your life and how you view other people and your view on reality. And I think a study in drowning is a very fitting title for this, both with the literal, um, there's like this drowning that is happening in this country where pretty much the, the sea is rising and uh, it's going to wipe out certain areas, but then also metaphorically that feeling when you feel as though you can't escape the impact of what has happened to you. So I thought that was really, really well done. I liked another character that is in this quite a bit. Uh, this is currently a standalone. Really enjoyed it. I I would recommend this one uh, pretty highly, regardless of whether you typically read YA or adult fantasy. I think it's mature enough and it tackles uh, certain themes that I would say I would find more often in an adult fantasy, actually, or maybe the way in which they're done feels more adult. Plus, the character is a little bit older than what we usually see. But if you do really like YA works, I don't think that this is outside of what you might typically enjoy. So highly recommend this one. And I'm really excited. Thank you to the patron who uh, wanted, who wrote that as, you know, the thing that you really enjoyed, because I can absolutely see why. I thought it was quite good, exceptional, uh, honestly. I really, really enjoyed that work. Now for the last one for today, which would be The Girl in the Tower 
finally, <laughs> I finally read this. I read Winter Night quite a while back and I have been meaning to continue on with the series. It was one of my goals this year, not just to continue this series, but more series in general, because like, of a, lot, like a lot of us at some point we realize, oh my gosh, I am in the middle of so many series. And sometimes you can't help that if it's a newer work and the series isn't done, but other times you can totally help it. And uh, in this case, that was what the situation was. So I was like, I need to finally get around to this. Really enjoyed this so much. I think I liked it more than the first book. I was surprised how the author navigated the beginning of the story and how we return to our main character. I thought the way in which that was done was actually pretty cool, but they definitely took a chance because you kind of are, it's a, you're, you're very distant for a while. And then when you finally come back to the character, you're like, oh, here we go. But it took a long time. And, and I don't always love that, but I really appreciate one, the different way in which the author went about it. I respect that decision. And I think the execution was very good. I, I definitely think this author blends historical fiction and fantasy really well. And this is why I've said before that historical fiction to me feels like a natural genre for fantasy readers to also enjoy because it feels like you're reading about a fantasy because the past is so different from our current lives. And I think as a result, uh, this should be, you know, right up my alley. And I don't know why it took me so long to get it, but I'm so glad I picked it up because it did fit exactly what I was wanting with historical and fantasy blended together. It genuinely feels like, oh yeah, that's the past. Even though it's obviously, you know, there's there's make-believe in here, but the way in which the folklore fits into historical things, historical events, the culture of the time and the place, I just thought it was very seamless. And in the story itself and what's happening, our main character is fighting to, one, have more freedom and agency in her own life. So kind of similar things to what you see in Addie LaRue. But she's also fighting for other people, some of which are personal relationships that she has, family members, things like that. And then some of it's just people. She's just trying to do what's right. And in that sense, I was like, she's so cool. <laughs> I uh, It has a hint of a Mulan plot line. Mulan was one of my favorite Disney movies growing up. So I was all about that. And she's just a force to be reckoned with. The folklore remains mysterious to me, and I think, I'm guessing based off of where we leave off in this one, that we're going to start to get more answers. There's hints of it along the way throughout this book, but I do think that really diving into the fantasy and the folklore elements is likely going to happen in the third. I don't know for a fact, because I haven't read it just yet, but I plan to very soon so I can finish up this trilogy, and I'm really excited to see what happens. She's just awesome. Uh, this main character to me, I think she's one of my... I, I want to say she's one of my favorites, but I don't have the personal connection to her the way I do a Kaladin or something from Stormlight Archive. But I still, I think it almost feels like I'm watching a movie. And so maybe I don't feel like, oh, she's me or, oh my gosh, I relate to this character. And I also don't look at her and think she's so different from me, but yet I feel for her. She makes me change how I see the world or anything like that. I just root for her. I think it's probably the best way to put it. So in that sense, she's a very rootable main character. And I very much enjoyed this. It's a drier writing style, I would say, than some other works, uh, some other well-known fantasy, but I actually really like it. I think it feels very fitting to the story that's being told and the time in which we're reflecting. But anyway, that's it for some books that I have picked up recently. As I said at the beginning, there are quite a few other things I have picked up recently and just haven't had the chance to sit down and really talk about more in depth. So I'll be doing that more soon. Uh, if you're interested in any of these books or information about them, I'll have that in the description bar down below. Thanks so much for watching though. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.